Yeah, it's a great honor, Dennis. You were introducing me yesterday, and now I can introduce you. Uh, Dennis is lead data scientist at Big Data Republic, and he has uh, experience at various companies. Uh, even before that, he studied econometrics and political science. Um, so, short question, uh, Dennis. What made you choose political science? Um, that's a <laughs> that's an interesting question. So, uh, actually, uh, when I was studying, I thought I wanted to become a politician. Um, but then um, I realized, actually, that uh, most people would hate you uh, when you're doing your job. So then, uh, yeah, I actually got into data science to, uh, yeah, to be sort of more actually practical in what you build and uh, have an impact there. Okay, cool. And now everybody loves you. <laughs> well, that I, I hope, but uh, one can only wish. Yes. All well, right. the floor is all yours. So my name is uh, Dennis Gemond and I'm a lead data scientist at Big Data Republic. And um, today I will uh, talk you through how uh, together with our client, uh, Liberty Global, um, we are monitoring a large scale TV streaming service uh, using artificial intelligence. And specifically, I'm gonna talk about how we use graph analytics to, uh, to achieve this. Um, let me just get this clicker working. Yes. So you may not have heard of uh, Liberty Global before, um, uh, but actually, in fact, it's the largest uh, broadband cable provider in Europe, uh, which means they supply sort of uh, TV and internet over the cable. Um, and you may know them from some of their more familiar brands, um, like in the Netherlands, Ziggo, uh, in Belgium, uh, Telenet, um, in the UK as Virgin Media, and by its older trade name, uh, UPC in other countries. So what I want to talk about today is the, uh, the, the, the new dig digital TV platform uh, that uh, Liberty Global has built. So it's serving 4K digital content to uh, over a million customers. And they do this by using uh, what's called a set-top box mainly. So you may know these sort of digital TV boxes that you get when you get your subscription and uh, uh, also supplementary and app. So what's the kind of functionality that we expect, right? So a lot of these things you'll, you'll probably uh, recognize. For example, you can search for specific content. Um, you can use a program, uh, electronic program guide uh, to look up stuff that's, uh, you know, uh, uh, going on right now. And uh, more recently, you can also use this to sort of go back and look, to, uh, look at stuff um, in the past and content that's been recorded for you. Of course, there's also going to be all sorts of AI used to make uh, uh, tailored recommendations and suggestions. Um, and finally, <clears throat> a lot of these services also offer on-demand video choice and uh, TV series, much like you would use in, uh, for example, a Netflix app. So this is the happy flow. But what if something goes wrong and where could it go wrong? So in order to explain how that could happen, uh, let me take you through how uh, content actually goes from one location where it's stored into your device uh, or into your uh, uh, set-top box. So it starts in the home where uh, you have all these uh, uh, devices and what you do when you turn on your TV is you send a request uh, uh, to a backend uh, to get uh, um, uh, all the sort of information that's displayed on the screen. So first it goes to the hybrid fiber coax network. That's all the cables in the ground that form a very complex network uh, all the way back to uh, uh, the cable provider. It goes through a backbone and then into, through a load balance balancer into um, uh, what we call the backend. And this backend is actually in fact a very complex um, uh, interconnected system of microservices that each perform a specific task like search, recommendation, or checking if you've made the right purchases for specific content. Um, and this is actually, uh, uh, these are all running in pods, and these pods are running on top of VMs, and then these VMs are running on top of uh, a bare metal in a network of machines that this, uh, that this company has. Right, so there's a lot of complexity there. So what happens if, for example, one of these services uh, fails? Um, this could happen if, uh, for example, during Formula One on a Sunday afternoon, as you may know, in the Netherlands, it's become suddenly very popular because we have this, uh, uh, we have Max Verstappen, who's a, a very good race car driver. So maybe too many people are trying to log in at the same time and one of these services fails. 
So suppose that it actually doesn't fail and it, it works. Then there's still um, uh, the matter of getting the content actually to your device. So the next step is to send you some metadata, some information on where you can actually stream the content from. And then you can connect directly to what's called the content delivery network. All the big companies use this when they stream content. YouTube does it. Netflix does it. Um, a CDN is basically a distributed network of, um, of servers that store your digital content, but they store geographically close to you so that it can get to you very quickly. Right? So this is a very old technique, but it's actually very effective to make sure that you get your, uh, what you want to see very quickly. Also, there's something might go wrong. You might, uh, it might be the case that you don't have certain content available. Maybe it hasn't been ingested or prepared properly for you. So that's just a sort of a taste of what uh, could go wrong. As you can understand, the digital TV system is very complex, interconnected. Um, and crucially, if something goes wrong, a lot of things can go wrong at the same time, right? So you won't know immediately what's the real cause because everything is sort of connected to each other. So um, we're going to solve this, of course, this problem with data. And we have lots of data sources around this whole ecosystem. We have data coming in uh, from the set of boxes. We have detailed information about the requests that are going between all these different microservices. Uh, but we also know something about the performance uh, of the underlying, um, uh, of the underlying uh, pod infrastructure. And finally, um, uh, the content delivery system, of course, also tracks a lot of stuff for us. So what we do is we bring this all together in a sort of high performance telemetry streaming uh, platform. Um, and there we have sort of uh, uh, log document storage, easy access with querying, a time series databases, dashboarding, and that's what we're going to use to do the troubleshooting. So how does that go? We have a group of around 250 expert TV engineers that are usually you know, available in some way or another to do troubleshooting. They have these very advanced dashboards at their disposal, look at complicated graphs and, 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 and alerts that they, can, uh, uh, that they need to investigate. And they, of course, can go into the log level data to, uh, uh, to find uh, uh, more information. But as you can imagine, the number of these dashboards is going to grow exponentially. And of course, as you add more data sources, as the platform grows also in terms of users, the amount of logs to check can also grow. So can we reduce the time that's spent uh, on troubleshooting during an incident um, by using AI for IT operations monitoring, or AI ops uh, uh, for short? And the main use cases we're looking at there is to reduce Sort of false positives that come from using uh, fixed uh, thresholds for alerts. And uh, we can do that by uh, uh, using anomaly detection. So that's something that we've extensively worked on. We've, there's uh, lots of interesting things to say, things to say about it. Uh, we're using Spark basically to scale out uh, the Facebook profit library to parallelize sort of anomaly detection on a lot of time series. Um, very interesting topic, but out of scope for this, uh, for this talk. Um, once you know what kind of anomalies are happening at the same time, maybe you can uh, identify which one of them, uh, which ones are most correlated and you're part, probably part of the same incident. And finally, can we actually um, uh, find out what the root cause is? So that's what I want to focus on today. So in order to use troubleshooting, uh, to use AI for this troubleshooting, we need to formulate it as a graph problem. So I'm showing a graph here. Um, showing these components that, uh, that you've been introduced to. And we have this concept of a node. And between nodes, they're connected with edges. And if, in this case, we have a directed edge because there's an error on it, right? So there's a direction of the HTTP request. Now, you may have heard of adjacency matrices. And on the right here, we see how on the sort of vertical axis, what the origin of the request is on the uh, horizontal axis, what the destination is, right? So a one means it's connected. What if we make it a little bit uh, uh, more interesting? We can add weights to these edges. Maybe we're uh, interested in the amount of failed requests between services. We can also see how the adjacency matrix updates in that case. But as you can imagine, um, this might not say a lot. That suggests that uh, this number 123 is the highest. 
uh, but we don't know if that's actually normal behavior. Maybe uh, uh, that's actually always around this uh, number. So maybe we can do some sort of normalization of this. So for this, we've used uh, a sort of profit to normalize these time series to an anomaly score so that at any given time, we know how anomalous uh, the requests from one service to the next are. So now you can already get a feeling of which, uh, um, which service is the culprit, right? It's, it's, it's looking to be the on-demand service. There's most red arrows, big red arrows pointing towards it. Um, but maybe we can calculate that algorithmically. So Google, uh, uh, Larry Page uh, and uh, Sergey Brin, uh, they originally designed the original PageRank algorithm um, for ranking websites when you do a search. And what they've done is they've basically looked at the quality and, um, uh, and quantity of uh, links from one website to the next to determine these edge weights. And then they simulate the behavior of a, an individual that's surfing the internet um, uh, uh, to determine uh, which websites they're most likely to end up in uh, in the end, based on how many links between the websites there are. So it's kind of a random walk. So what does that look like? Very simply, we start maybe at the STB and we follow the edges proportional to the uh, uh, edge weights. Uh, uh, so we, with the prob probability of taking each step uh, proportional to the edge weights. So how do we calculate this numerically? Um, so as you see on the right, I've normalized this adjacency matrix and I've done that by out degree. So out degree is the sum of outgoing um, uh, edge weights, or if you have an unweighted graph, it's just the sum of outgoing, ed uh, the number of outgoing edges. So you can see that the horizontal, uh, 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 the, the rows basically add up to one. So it's effectively acting as a transition probability. So how likely am I to go from the STD to uh, the next given service? We then um, randomly initialize some node probability vector, and for some number of iterations, we just update the, uh, the probability vector by multiplying it by doing a dot product with the uh, adjacency matrix. Right? And you can see that if the, sort of the, edge, uh, the edge weight is very high, then that probability, uh, the incoming edge weights are very high, then the probability vector will, after all these iterations, uh, probably be also be the largest. Now, the uh, simulation, uh, the, the, the pure simulation variation of this also has some probability of restart, right? So uh, the surfer doesn't always keep going. At some point, he stops and he restarts. Uh, this is something that we approximate with some damping factor. Uh, by the way, this, this uh, use of iterations, is a, it's, it's called a form of uh, a power iteration solution to this problem. Um, Good practice here is also to use self loops, so have some, uh, uh, some number on the diagonal as well, because otherwise the algorithm is always going to have to move to the next node, even if it's not uh, a, very, uh, a very relevant uh, outgoing connection there. Um, all right, so what does this look like in code? I have my JCC matrix here. Um, in the pre processing, I added this, uh, this diagonal, uh, this I matrix. Um, and I normalize by the uh, horizontal axis. This is the result. Um, and a very simple implementation of the PageRank algorithm. Um, as I said, initialize the, uh, the probability vector um, and multiply it by this, uh, this, this uh, adjacency matrix a number of times. And as you see here in the results, um, indeed, the on-demand service is the one that has the highest probability score after these iterations. Um, of course, there are some limitations. Google is no longer using this algorithm as the only way to rank uh, websites. It's one of the ways that they do it, or a well, hybrid way to do it, and that's because it has uh, uh, limitations. So first of all, there's still a chance of getting stuck in the deep end of the graph. So for that, it's also possible that besides the diagonal to use uh, backward loops, so maybe make it some, uh, uh, some part of the matrix, uh, make it symmetrical. Another one is the fact that um, the, 
uh, the, the PageRank algorithm has the ab ability to use personalization. So after a restart, you could use uh, a you could assign a higher probability of restarting at a specific node using a, a personalization vector. And but even even giving these two things, so even giving that we uh, uh, could use maybe some node features, it's essentially still going to be univariate. So it's just one uh, uh, one sort of feature that you can use either for the nodes or for the edges, and that's essentially the problem when we run into heterogeneity. And heterogeneity is actually, when you look at re uh, graph problems in real life, um, that's actually the most common situation. But when you look at them in theory, it's the least uh, dealt with. So in our case, we have these two types of nodes. We have the set -top box, which generates completely different data than all these microservices. Um, and this is something that the PageRank algorithm is not meant to handle. And one last point is it's essentially a ranking algorithm. So it will just tell you, it will give, give you a, a, a proportion of how important all the nodes are. But it won't, won't tell you anything about if there is an issue going on in general. In our use case, we have, um, uh, we have some incident, but sometimes, uh, actually most of the times, there's not an incident, right? So we're not interested in finding the most important uh, or the most failing service, uh, we're interested in, in knowing if a uh, service is failing. Um, so uh, what you can do sort of to try and extend this, this page rank uh, uh, thinking, uh, maybe we can use some deep learning approaches. And a very interesting one uh, that's very recent is uh, inspired by image convolutions. So if you would visualize, a, um, visualize an image as basically all the pixels to be organized on a grid and connected to their closest neighbors. Uh, an image convolution is, of course, where you use some sort of kernel to move over these uh, over the graph or move over the pixels and um, aggregate information, pool information uh, uh, from the pixel features. So can, can we extend this analogy to graphs? Well, we can. So it's essentially the same, only it's much more much less uh, densely connected. So here as well, we can use a kernel, but in this case, uh, the kernel we're going to use is the adjacency matrix because it tells us which nodes are neighboring each other. And using the adjacency matrix, that's how we can pull the node feature uh, information uh, from one feature to uh, the next in the local neighborhood. So you can think of it as uh, uh, going through the graph and looking at the neighborhood for each node. And in the problem that we've been discussing, this would be, for example, the neighborhood around the search service, and this would be the neighborhood around the um, purchase service. So how does it look like if we want to build the actual uh, a Keras layer, for example? So we have our, uh, uh, our graph on the left side again, whereas just for simplicity for now, uh, I've just assumed that all the node types are the same. So we have two node features. It can be any arbitrary number, but at least they all have the same amount of features. We take our JCC matrix, we multiply it by the uh, node features matrix, and we multiply that by some dense kernel. And you can see already, essentially what you're doing is you're uh, uh, using the adjacency matrix to propagate uh, node feature information through the graph. And of course, you're gonna have some weights to learn which information is more crucial to pass on uh, as compared to other information. And this is why it's called a form of message passing. Uh, so you can make this layer yourself in Keras. It's uh, very easy. Uh, the only thing you need to remember is to uh, pass both the adjacency matrix and the, uh, the, uh, the node feature matrix as uh, a tensors at the same time as you're uh, creating the, uh, the layers. Um, and after that, it's uh, uh, just two dot product products that you have to um, uh, calculate. But if you remember, as I said, we actually don't often have that case where all the node features are exactly the same. Very often we have data from different sources. So we have this heterogeneity. So what can we do about that? So one very simple uh, approach 
uh, that, um, that I found was successful is to just um, create first an embedding layer uh, after both sets of uh, node features and just adding the result, right? So, or you can do some multiplication or maybe if you're really, uh, uh, if you're really um, feeling lucky, you could use maybe some sort of attention mechanism, uh, but essentially uh, uh, in some basic examples did, uh, this turned out uh, to be quite effective. Um, and then you actually go back to your uh, previous situation, right? You just have two features, uh, which we can then uh, pull through a graph convolution. And this is how that looks. So we have this embeddings on the first layer of features, and then we can use the regular graph convolution. So this is where uh, uh, graph deep learning uh, usually ends up. And then the, the remark is always, okay, now you can use it for downstream uh, 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 prediction tasks like node classification, uh, link prediction, uh, forecasting, anything that you want to use structural information for. Uh, in our case, we're interested in this root cause. So for every, um, uh, for every node, we have this softmax output. So all the probability sum to one um, uh, to identify whether each node in the graph is having an issue or not. And this is information, of course, that we would like to uh, be supplied by, uh, by end users. So what are some learnings? Uh, normalizing this adjacency matrix is super important. It probably the first few times that you do doesn't learn anything is because of that. Um, and the, in our case, these labels for root causes were very sparse. So some services barely have any incidents. So we've had some success uh, using uh, sample weights for that, um, but of course, you know, there are probably uh, many more interesting approaches you can take there. So what does it look like in code? Um, this is the case for when we use the, uh, uh, the two feature sets uh, embedding. Uh, so we basically just concatenate uh, the inputs by uh, using these two uh, uh, embedding layers. Uh, and after that, we can basically use any number of graph convolutions depending on how far you want information to be passed. Uh, and it's good practice to use a dropout in between. So how do we, uh, uh, how could one uh, uh, implement this in practice? Um, so maybe we start out with this Google PageRank algorithm to already have uh, some unsupervised approach uh, to at least start generating some labels. And then these labels can be validated by uh, expert engineers, either reject, reject or accept them, which of course then uh, becomes a sort of feedback loop where then we can take more leverage, take more advantage of, uh, uh, of diverse feature sets, uh, uh, maybe even time evolving information over time. Initial results uh, show us that around, uh, from hand labeling, around uh, 100 to 200 quality labels could uh, help to jumpstart this, uh, this system. And the main challenge we're facing right now is to actually start collecting these labels on a structural basis because the engineers are, of course, very busy people. Um, one of the things that uh, I was very interested in a recent project uh, uh, that might be interesting for this is to use uh, sort of rule-based label generation. Um, and the Snorkel project has some uh, really interesting uh, uh, magic going on on how to actually um, uh, generate better labels uh, from, uh, from a collection of uh, labeling rules. So I really, uh, yeah, I urge you to have a look at that as well. So what are some extensions? Um, remember the page rank algorithm, actually you can use it as, a, as an output layer in your neural network as well. It's a very, uh, uh, as you remember these, uh, these uh, power iterations, you can actually have that also in a, a Keras layer. And effectively, uh, in many cases, you don't even need all these graph convolutions anymore. You can just have very simple dense layers in between. And then at the end, um, uh, you can use the, uh, you can use the page rank algorithm to just uh, uh, propagate uh, the softmax output that you've gotten, like you would originally do with, uh, with page rank. So basically you're using neural network to learn the, uh, uh, some information from the nodes and then just use page rank to, uh, to finish, the, finish the task basically. Uh, one thing to note, of course, that as I said before, this only works for, for ranking problems.
and this is how this uh, looks. I also have shared uh, in the Discord uh, GitHub page with uh, uh, what some of these examples worked out. So you can look into them if you uh, if you want to later. So another one that's very interesting is that uh, you may have a question or you may be asking already yourself, but hey, wait, you're really looking at this sort of snapshot in time, failed requests over what period of time? Usually we look at uh, five minutes, but actually this is the graph is dynamic, right? It's constantly changing. So there's temporal information in the features and in the edges. So, so far we've solved this problem by normalizing these time series using the Facebook profit uh, library. So we haven't needed uh, this solution very uh, often yet, but many real world problems will have this problem of um, uh, uh, time evolving uh, features. So what's one interesting approach uh, that you can take there is uh, if you have uh, a sequence of time steps, every the node features at every time step, you can pull those through a graph convolution and then pass the output to a, a set of GRUs, which can then in turn be used for a downstream prediction task. In our case, it would be this root cause uh, classification. So I also highly recommend looking at this uh, this, this paper or these kinds of approaches. All right, so uh, working towards a wrap up. So for us, it was also very much a sort of an, uh, an adventure or, or a, a sort of um, taking a deep dive into this area of graph deep learning. And I feel that uh, uh, it's in many ways really still in its infancy. Um, there's little to no standardization in uh, the common uh, deep learning frameworks that we know, like PyTorch or TensorFlow. Uh, so you'll find yourself really sort of uh, uh, looking at all these papers from all over the place, uh, and many of them have only been published last year. Uh, this graph convolution has only been invented, spatial graph convolutions only invented like uh, three years ago. So, um, uh, and, 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 and even then, if you uh, try to apply these algorithms in the real world, your graph problems actually can be slightly different or more complicated than the one in the paper. And this especially goes for these heterogeneous problems and temporal problems. Um, so there's no one size fits all solution. Um, and that's a crucial thing, right? So, so it's very hard at this point to have a library that has just an API that sees what your graph problem is and then arranges everything under the hood. You really have to think about that yourself. So there are some interesting projects on this. Uh, a stellar graph, there's also a company behind it. And they've taken the approach to um, uh, to implement lots of algorithms for lots of papers. Um, and their backends are sort of inspired by this Network X uh, uh, graph analytics library. And lastly, uh, Google DeepMind is working uh, in, uh, in a project uh, called GraphNet, uh, but it's much more low level and really also aimed at solving core uh, AI uh, questions. So just to give you an idea of how that, uh, how that mismatch between sort of theory and reality goes, uh, so these are all the algorithms that are implemented by a stellar graph. They're all from a, a different paper. And these are how they map to specific uh, um, attributes of your graph problem. So is it heterogeneous? Is it directed? Are there edge weights? Is it temporal? Or are there node features? Uh, and as you can see, not one of them actually tackles all of them. Um, and probably if you dive into it, there's probably going to be some specific that doesn't map to your problem either. So um, and the question is, is such an approach going to work in the end, right? That we have a million solutions uh, where you have to find the right one. All right, to conclude. So um, I hope I convinced you today that with AI ops, we can help reduce the time spent troubleshooting uh, using stuff like anomaly detection, correlation, and automated root cause detection. Um, with graph deep learning, uh, if we set it up in the proper way, we can jumpstart a learning system as we collect labels. And yeah, some notes on this field in general, I think it's, reaching, it's a very exciting field with many applications. Um, there's a lot more standardization going to be needed uh, yeah, before you can uh, uh, really solve problems out of the box. 
So let's make sure we keep a distance for the last part of the conference, right, Dennis? Yes. Yeah, thank you very much uh, uh, for your uh, talk. Um, yeah, so uh, a few questions. Uh, so uh, you explain it's a really new and exciting field. Uh -huh. um, so, but what do you see in terms of applications? What can you foresee in the future? What possible applications could be? Um, it's, a, it's a very good question. So uh, in, in, in this field of oper IT operations monitoring, the application is very obvious mm -hmm. because it very quickly becomes about this topology of interconnected parts. Um, but actually, there are many people who argue that uh, you can formulate any, almost any machine learning problem as a graph problem, right? There's always going to be uh, 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 links between different data sets, different components uh, uh, that you know, describe some sort of causality. That's why, of course, many people work with, uh, uh, with Bayesian networks. So there's lots of uh, stuff in the fields of you know, logistics, uh, we recently talked to uh, a company that's working with shipping technology, uh, but of course, traffic prediction, that's a very classic one. Uh, the GraphNet's uh, Google DeepMind came out with an interesting uh, work on that recently. So yeah, I would say lots of opportunities. Yeah. Okay, cool. And would you say that like the traffic uh, uh, examples that one part that makes the problems interesting is because you actually have very big graphs, right? Because yeah. it's like any possible route that you can take across the world. Yeah. So do you think this really helps like having your deep learning algorithm break down on specific parts of the uh, graph? Um, so you mean that it, could, uh, that it could break because the graphs are very complicated or? Well, it makes learning more efficient because you can like localize the learning around specific parts of your graph, especially when the graph is really big. Yeah, yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting uh, point also about that there's some that's sort of the difference in uh, graph deep learning between inductive and, and, uh, and transductive uh, learning, I think. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. where you have the sort of uh, inductive learning, then uh, you actually sort of learn local representations of your network. So if there's new data coming in or new connections being made, um, then uh, you don't need to update the whole graph or the whole network. So that's, yeah, that's a very interesting point. Yeah. And, and that's probably why they had this success at, uh, at DeepMind. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool, interesting. And uh, one other question is, uh, you uh, um, nicely illustrated your feedback loop for the uh, people labeling the data. Yeah. So if you explore uh, any ways of doing some active learning to label specific uh, things. That's a very good question. And actually, uh, that's, uh, uh, I had, I had some, some papers that I wanted to look at on that, and that's really going to be the next step, I think, because that's going to make this, this process a lot more efficient, right? Because then we will really focus on the important things rather than just having them label anything. So that's a very good suggestion. Yeah. yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much.